Dracula. <laughs> yes! Liar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start, guys. Okay. I've, I've, enjoy, I've enjoyed Anne Rice's books, but Dracula. <laughs> I'm not an Anne Rice fan. Just, just wait. Yes, just wait so... till the debate. I'll change your mind. And we're also <laughs> like it. Count Chocula. There you go. Count Chocula. There we go. Ready? Guys? Yep. The Count from Sesame Street. There we go. 30 seconds. Here we go, guys. We are live. As of now, we're recording. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's episode of Paranormal Encyclopedia. This is episode seven. Um, we don't have a guest tonight, although we do have a surprise caller already. Um, we're just going to kick back, have a little bit of fun, and do kind of an old style telethon. Um, try and raise some money for the channel and have a lot of fun. Yes. I'm going to do magic. Oper operators are standing by, as as you can clearly see. <laughs> <laughs> and if you send money, they can sit. Yes, yes. <laughs> we we let them sit if they get enough money. Each share. What did we decide? Each share is hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, hundred dollars. <laughs> so let's do the round robin of who's who. So I'm of course the main host, Kevin Mears, demonologist, paranormal investigator, and as you're going to see tonight, magician. Yes. I'm uh, Brian McKinley, uh, author and uh, godfather of vampire thrillers. I'm Amisha Campbell, psychic. <laughs> and Patrick, if you want to introduce yourself as a surprise first caller. I'm Patrick Thomas. I'm uh, an author. I write the Murphy's Lore books, which include vampires, uh, the Dear Cthulhu Advice Comms, uh, and the Mystic Investigator series. I have some questions for Cthulhu. If uh, <laughs> Maybe we could do that as a segment. Well, I think there's the first thing to start with. You know, we could ask some advice from Cthulhu. Well, particularly, I want Brian's idea on this, and I want your idea, Patrick. So a meme sure. that just hit Facebook. If you had to pick three superheroes to fight Cthulhu with no time for them to prepare, who are your three? Uh, it has to be Superman for one of them because he's <laughs> Superman. Uh, Spectre, because he'd be on a similar power level. And I guess you got Superman and Spectre. The third one doesn't matter so much. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Want somebody? Uh, let's see who can teleport like large objects. Um, eh, let's blow the flash in just for fun. I, I, the third hero doesn't matter much. Batman might be a good technician, but you know he's not going to do much other than be tactical and you know maybe throw some explosives at him. Um, I think Batman's a good yeah. choice, and I'll tell you why. He's a Gary okay. too. He gets out of everything. <laughs> well, it depends. Is it, is it Batman's comic book? Is it an Elseworlds? Is it? It, it, that, yeah. it depends on that too. Because yeah. if it's Superman's comic, Superman will win. True. Is it a horror comic that you know the, it's an Elseworlds and Cthulhu is going to win? You know, so it, it depends. Uh, you know who's writing it. Who's He's got true. the whole world so, advantage. Brian, what do you think? Oh. Uh... I would definitely have to agree about uh, Superman just because you, you generally try to bring him into everything. Um, <laughs> Plus, he is pretty much in stuff. He's, he's pretty good. Um, I would think, I'm trying to think, somebody like maybe Green Lantern uh, used to dealing with yeah. uh, that, that kind of Makes level, sense. level of threats. I don't know comics that that well, so, um, but isn't there somebody like... Um, was it Galacticus or Galactus? Yeah, or Silver Surfer. Or unless, and Phoenix, yeah, unless, unless Cthulhu suddenly turned into a planet, Galactus is kind of, you know. I'm not <laughs> interested. Exactly. Yeah, no. Wait, he's on a planet. Can I eat it? Okay, <laughs> Cthulhu, you're out of here. Yeah, exactly. You I, want somebody that can go beyond uh, planets. My solution yeah, does I'm, not involve Superman, believe it or not. No. So my solution is. It's one character, any incarnation, the Doctor. Okay. Well, again, if it's yeah, the Doctor, sure we're good. He's shown up. I disagree. He has shown up in Marvel comic books. Therefore, he's a superhero. Wow. That's a guest appearance. He was not originally created. No, he actually had his own. Character. He wasn't originally created, but he did have his own series. And also keep in mind that if it, Marvel does something with them, they make him official canon. Yeah. So the official canon, Transformers are part of the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. Which means apparently so is the Doctor in Star Wars. Well, and Star Trek apparently, because uh, was it Marvel or DC? I think have both met up with. Uh, Next I know Gen. Marvel has. 
Yeah. I it, think Green Lanterns teamed up with Star Trek, and I think uh, the X Men teamed up with Star Trek. Yep, I remember the X Men and uh, Next Gen. And the, I remember um, Linkara reviewing Link, the Lantern Corps crossing over with Star Trek. Um, I will also say, if you if you insist on me picking more conventional superheroes, um, I'd have to go with Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange was another one I was thinking of. He would be good. Doctor Fate. Well, you have to look to Doctor Fate, Doctor Strange, and Tana. Uh, you know the, the the mystical heavy hitters. Yeah, Although, yeah. like I said, I still say the Spectre because yeah, he's in, in the old comic books. Yeah, he 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 became a planet size and tried to keep two Earths from merging. And that's like a cosmic level power that pretty much is going to be hard to beat. Yeah, I'd say without going cosmic level because obviously, okay. Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet could probably beat Cthulhu in a fight yeah. one to one. Um, My world. <laughs> and Thanos without the Infinity Gauntlet could probably give him a run for his money at least for a while. But um, so Doctor Strange, Doctor Fate. I'd also say um, for a third choice, I just thought of, oh Constantine, because while he's not all that powerful, he's enough of a con man to figure it out. Hmm. Right, but he would be involving other people to do the work for him. Well, that's uh, why he has Doctor Strange and Doctor Fate to do all the heavy lifting. There you go. He'd be the distraction. Well, when it comes to different crossovers, I mean, there's one that almost nobody knows about. There's um, a DC character called the Phantom Stranger who actually had a crossover with, with Neil Gaiman and Sam, Sandman at one point. Mm. Several well, have actually, actually, a lot of people did because Neil Gaiman wrote in a bunch of superheroes. Martian Manhunter was in the Sandman. Uh, the Sandman, the uh, 1970s hero, was in it. And then uh, Hawkman's son became that Sandman for a while. And then his son became the new Sandman. And they did cross over a bunch of superheroes at different times in the Sandman series. So, uh, you know, quite a few of them did. And then didn't Daniel Sandman show up in a Justice League at some point? Or? I think so. I'm not certain. Yep. Now I'm just thinking a fun fact. Apparently both Martian Manhunter and Superman are fans of Sailor Moon. Alrighty then. That is amazing. And yes, well, you uh, know. Apparently Why not? <laughs> at one point Martian Manhunter morphed into a Japanese woke reporter named uh, why can I not remember her, her name, full name but Ray and uh, Superman commented, isn't that a little on the nose? You know, basically transform into Sailor Mars. Oh, well. Okay, then. <laughs> okay, that works. Well, that's the thing with comic books. You can, um, you know, if you can get away with not doing it. Um, I just started reading the Invincible series. I'm, I don't know, somewhere in the trade paperbacks, like probably around issues 30. But there's one where the character gets thrown through the different universes, and he's obviously talking to both Spider-Man and Batman at different points. But, of course, you know, they don't show the full thing, so that way they don't have to... Uh, to uh, Copyright issues, yeah. Rehina, that's the name. It's going to bother me if I didn't look it up. Although Batman and Spider-Man have apparently crossed over. Because there's the comment uh, with, in the Marvel vs. DC when Spider-Man runs into Joker. Spider-Man, I presume, although you've changed tailors since last time we tangled. <laughs> Yeah, no, they did, they did, well, the original was what, the Superman, Spider-Man with Doc Ock and Lex Luthor as the villains, and then they did um, Batman versus the Hulk, I, um, so this first Batman has to win. This is why I can't follow uh, And then, and then yeah. they did all the crossovers, and then they did the ones where the characters merged, and, you know, Batman and Wolverine become one character, and so on and so forth. But uh, at some point, I think they crossed over everything. And then you got the vote who uh, who would win, who was going to win. Yeah. So, which uh, led to some yeah. very like, no, they really probably shouldn't have won that fight situations. <laughs> well, I think a couple of them were it was fan favorite voting. But yeah, they as a whole, Spider Man versus Superboy. Superboy didn't have enough of a following. So, and Spider Man is Spider Man. Yeah, but you know. You're putting up people, you know, the, the the fair one was probably Wonder Woman versus Storm because they both had popularity, although I'd say if that was done today, Wonder Woman might win um, because of the yeah. movies and the yeah. other stuff. But uh, it, it's, you know, and, it, you know, Wolverine versus Lobo, it just, Lobo's fought Superman to a standstill. It just, 
yeah, didn't no. make sense. Well, wasn't, um, wasn't Lobo originally created specifically as like a parody of Wolverine? Um, no, he was originally in Omega Man as a bounty hunter in like an orange and I want to say pink jumpsuit. Oh, good lord. Um, so he was a bounty hunter I um, in the Omega before. Man series, which is the Vega system, a bunch of world stuff going on. And then Keith Griffin decided to bring him along when he did uh, ju- the Justice League International series mm. and decided, well, let's make him, you know, let's put him in a leather jacket and give him a motorcycle. Although he did have kind of a space cycle on the other one. <laughs> um, and then he became more of a parody of himself, I guess. But, you know, for a time there, he was immensely popular because it was kind of a, a reaction to the violent heroes of that time. Right. Which you know, Wolverine say. and Punisher was good. And all of a sudden we have to make all the other heroes. Okay, uh, let's have everybody kill somebody. The 90s. You know, Spider-Man killed somebody. Yeah. Superman killed somebody. Wonder Woman killed somebody. You know, the only one who didn't kill somebody was Batman. But in the movies, he started killing people. It really matter in some of the early comics. I think actually in several comics, he's killed people. Well, yeah, in the early ones. But at that time, and for the most part, Batman fails to save somebody. Yeah, Batman doesn't kill per se, and Superman didn't. But they made it such a extreme that even Superman couldn't you know, could justify killing the Phantom Zone villains so they didn't destroy Earth. So they made it so extreme that he had no choice. <sighs> Which is a pretty yeah. standard comic thing. If you, It's like, nope, yeah. especially the movies. Oh. Which if Superman yeah. and dealing with how far he should take his powers can actually be interesting. He it like, I'm not judge, jury, and executioner, and I don't want to be. Uh, Patrick, you there? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. It was just the way I would, it happened. I was wondering. You know, no. Yeah. Well, I've I've always been the type that you know the superheroes, the you know the, the high holding holding one shouldn't be killed. Like especially Superman, he has enough powers that he should be able to figure out something else. I mean, with Wonder Woman's character, it makes a certain amount of sense because she's a warrior. Um, you know. It's, Somebody like Spider Man, he should be working to do it. Um, you know, there can be situations, but you know, superheroes shouldn't kill. But you know, the Punisher is not a superhero. Yeah. yeah. So, no, it's know, like a, um, Superman is basically a plot device in terms of the level of power, <laughs> which can be done well and has been. But on the whole, it's like, no, he's a plot device, level power. No, it's like somebody <laughs> pointed out, you know, like a lot of people for Avatar The Last Airbender wanted Aang to kill Fire Lord Ozai. And it's like, no, that would have been the simple way out. That would have been the easy way out. I thought it was a much better ending than just killing him. Because it's like... As much as it is, a, is kind of a deus ex machina. It's also what I always thought with ending Harry Potter. My personal opinion of what I think Rowling could have done better is if you want to really destroy Voldemort, don't kill him. Make him a muggle. <laughs> ah. Yeah. Because, as for, yeah, exactly. Because if you think about what Dumbledore says, oh, I don't just want to kill you. It's like that implied to me. It's like no, he has something worse in mind, and ultimately, it's the eternal term, torment that you see in the movie and the book. But it's like no, if you really wanted to torture him, sure, do that when he dies, but take away what makes him special. He, he there's nothing worse you could do than the man. No, there's a lot of things that, no, simply killing the person is too merciful or too simple. You know, one of the webcomics I like, Goblins, uh, there was this uh, character that was known as the Goblin Hunter, and he was just a piece of work, that one. And and, and so it finally, it, one of the characters takes his revenge and takes his ear, er, and the Goblin Hunter goes, Ha, ah, you take in my ear. Here, now you're going in to show it all to your goblin friends and tell stories of how you defeated the great goblin hunter and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and he just goes, no, this is just a random encounter in my early days. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> it also makes me think of one of my favorite episodes of Doctor Who, Family of Blood. And the fact it's like, no, you just see how scary the Doctor can be in picking individual ways to torment the people who screwed with him without killing them. 
Oh, that also depends on the medium and the skill of the writer, too. True. Um, because, I mean, going back to Superman, the way they got around him killing people is they gave him a Phantom Zone projector in the old days. Mm -hmm. So, well, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to put you in the Phantom Zone. Um, Which but, is arguably that, you know, It's, you know, illegal in prison. Like, uh, I've enjoyed the Flash series. But, you know, the first season, uh, pretty much he's, got his own jail he's got his own prison he's putting people in yep which seems a little wrong and well for continuity purposes he go visit supergirl in one episode and he builds them a whole superpower jail but he hasn't done it for his city yeah. <laughs> you know to give I, the the police one you know yeah, I've so wondered about that it's like they're they're private citizens technically what they're actually doing is kidnapping, is kidnapping. they're they're breaking the law because they're holding these people against their will without any sort of due process also, have you right. noticed those cells don't seem to have a bathroom in them? So, you know, that's horrible. I mean, that's, Unfortunate implication. Yeah, exactly. Just think about that for a minute. That's that's just awful. Nobody ever thinks Well, I think there's probably a button and the toilet comes out, you know, your food pill comes out of the Slides out of the wall like on Star Trek <laughs> or something, yeah. That seems about right. Although, yeah, it's like, and I think it's, you know, there, it's one of those issues people don't mention as much with comic book characters of, okay, you know, Flash is imprisoning people in a pr his own private prison mm -hmm. without due process. Superman's basically doing the same thing by shoving them into the Phantom Zone. Yep. Um, for that matter, the whole concept of superheroes, with a few exceptions from time to time, are vigilantes. Yeah. They're explicitly operating outside of the law. Yes. Uh, so I remember watching a review of the... Unaired 2010, I want to say, Wonder Woman pilot, which, oh my various gods, was that awful. <laughs> so, but uh, the British person pointed out, yeah, you guys fought an entire, uh, my country, to get all these rights, and now you're just tossing them out the window. Yep. Apparently, America's greatest export is irony. Mm -hmm. Oh, damn, yeah, very, or hypocrisy. Yeah. That too. No, we're very, we're very good at ignoring the laws that uh, we find inconvenient at the moment. Actually, I just thought of something well, to ask Patrick. How's your podcast going? I am still, like I said, I want to have three months of episodes before I, plus the month you start with, mm -hmm. um, and I do not have that many yet. So gotcha. I am I am working on it still. So um, when I have, like I said, enough that I uh, don't have to, you know, worry if I miss a week because I want to try and uh, get a full year without missing a week we'll see if i can pull that off considering everything else i have going on but it's that a would lot be of my work. goal <laughs> i wish so, you but luck I, but I but i can I, i'm continuing to write a lot of material for it so now i just have to record it all <laughs> <laughs> so i still think everybody should take my way of doing things i don't write any i don't do lectures i don't do radio broadcasts i don't write anything in advance it works for see some i can i can get on and ad lib and everything else but for something for what I have in mind for this, it's it's best if it's planned. Yes. <laughs> in my in my mind, hopefully it turns out halfway as good as it is in my mind. <laughs> as much as I make in front of Brian for it, I do understand the purpose of scripting things. It just doesn't. I I work better off the cuff, or or at least outlining. I don't always script everything, well, but I yeah. like to I like to have an outline, this sort of a roadmap of where I want to go, just so that I don't spend you know, 10 minutes rambling pointlessly and, and losing my audience. Although in fairness, Brian, you did pretty good without your notes. I, I think just that only because I've given that topic several, or yeah. that talk several times before. So I was able to pull enough of it out of my memory. And then, like I said, the inspiration of going to a question and answer format, I think saved me because then I was able to just let the audience sort of dictate where it went rather than if I had tried to continue just going off the cuff, I, it would have, it would have quickly gone downhill. I was running out of material, but we could have kept it. If nothing else, I could have gotten up there and gotten, kept you going. Probably. Yeah. But no, I, my current record for a, for a lecture is five hours straight. Oh, jeez. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Most of the time when I do a panel or something, <laughs> It's, uh, you know, an hour or less, so yeah. uh, I have nothing to go. But I, I, I can 
talk for ages. So I just don't yeah. know at one point I would stop becoming, you know, like uh, Brian had said, you know, I don't want to bore the audience either. <laughs> well, that, that was the weird thing is it was supposed to be a lecture on the history of spiritualism. And it was set for two hours because I'm long winded, as everyone knows by now. Um, I, I'm aware of this aspect of my personality. I'm not necessarily going to call it a fault. <laughs> um, but I got through an hour and it was I was still pretty new to the lecture thing. And I was starting to fumble on where to go from where I was at. So I said, okay, does anybody have any questions? And the audience starts piping up with questions about the demonology thing. And it just went into an impromptu lecture on that. And I had this group of like 10 people hang, hung out with me. And we started at like 11 o'clock at night. Mm. So they hung out to, with me to like 4 in the morning. And I just kept going. Because, wow. okay, you guys want to listen. I'll keep talking. Yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's like one of those things where if you get into a really good conversation mm -hmm. with uh with a group of people like well like we did the first time yeah. we met oh, yeah. you know we sat and hung out and just talked about everything under the sun <laughs> yeah basically that's what happened and the old days of doing radio i did we do five hours it's a little easier then because it was lou and i bantering off each other along with taking calls but you know the lecture was people asking questions but mostly me talking speaking of calls now might be a good time to plug time the to number Plug the number and invite the studio audience. This is sort of a telethon, after all. <laughs> please, please call in. We're we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have Shermie the uh, the dancing dog in a, in a few minutes. Uh, you know he's warming up in the other room. So it's what's the number again? It's not written on my thing anymore. The number to call in. Six zero nine. Six zero nine. Eight zero seven two four nine two. Six zero nine eight zero seven two four nine two. Hopefully, hopefully, it'll be on the screen. It is on the screen. Yes. Okay. Good. It is on the screen, as is the Patreon link. If anybody feels like throwing money in our general direction, yes, give us money. Um, keep in mind, anyone out there who's running a business, we do offer advertising as well. You can find out about that on Patreon. And keep in mind, people, it costs us money to keep this thing running. Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll be honest, folks. I mean, you guys are probably listening to me and it's like, okay, you guys are doing radio. You have all the equipment. Why do you need money? Well, the reality is when you do radio, you pay for your time slot. It is, when we do a two-hour show like we're doing tonight, it's 80 bucks. If we do an hour show, it's 60 because our the guy who runs the station, station Gene, is absolutely awesome. <laughs> um, so it, at the moment we're paying, we, we actually just got a very generous donation from a buddy of mine. But we're, for the most part, we've been paying for this out of my po out of pocket, and I'm still working a nine to five job, not making that much. So we could definitely use the support. Absolutely. Also, if uh, if you need extra incentive, uh, Kevin, show him the sword. Those, <laughs> those, those operators uh, that we mentioned standing by. We're gonna stick this sword. Yeah, one of through them, somebody's throat tonight. One, one of them dies every hour. Every hour that we don't get money, and we're gonna do it live on camera. Yes. So you're going to hold the sword to the dog and send money or the dog gets it. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Well, Except we, instead of a dog, we're going to use our producer. Yeah, the problem is we found that the dog <laughs> elicits far too much sympathy and we wind up getting like animal rights activists threatened. <laughs> you don't us. want PETA on your no. case. No, so it's, it's You don't want them to, on your tail. Huh? It's, it's <laughs> yeah, to, exactly. It's easier to threaten human lives. I People do. are much less concerned about human lives. <laughs> it's true. See, what we really need is a lawyer to do it to. Nobody cares. <laughs> well, yeah, but then nobody would give money to save the lawyer. They, they'd <laughs> they'd pay to see if they yeah, get it. That's, that's where you say, okay, when we hit a certain threshold, we decapitate the lawyer. <laughs> this is what we need a Drew for. He's a law student, so he's not a lawyer, but he's in the ball he's ballpark. <laughs> he's a practitioner of the legal arts. <laughs> Well, to just make it sound that right, satanic. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the idea. There was a, there was a vampire movie one time, uh, rather funny, uh, called Vampire Journals. And this one old vampire uh, refers to, you know, a lawyer as a practitioner of the legal arts. <laughs> and, and I just thought, that sounds so cool. You know, it makes him sound like, you know, like a professor at Hogwarts or something. You know, <laughs> master. Comes in the keeps the professor of legal arts. Yes, the dark legal arts. Seems like he needs a level in there. He's like level nine practitioner of legal arts. Exactly, yeah. 
A gamer is... joke for all our gamer fans. Oh, yes. Well, I've I've often done that. So I want to make him character level, what, 18? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I think, I think, sadly, it would be nice if your age was your level, but it doesn't seem to actually work that way. Epic as, level! Yeah, as far as, like, getting... Uh, Getting better stuff as you as you level up. But, Roll uh, for injunction. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Much like He's NPCs, we keep adventuring. Casting injunction. Yeah. I should have a. I should be pretty high level now. I think by the amount of things I've gone through, it's like okay, I've fought demons before. That's usually pretty high up there. You would think. <laughs> you would think. You, you might just be a mid range necromancer that uh, gets extremely lucky on his dice rolls. All natural 20s when it yeah. comes down to it. Who knows? Oh, there's always the story of the first level gnome who got it, who picked a fight with a high level demon and rolled a series of natural 20s and one shot at it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and look at look at me. What am I? What am I? Like, at, at best, I'm like a level one or two bard or something. Or a, and you're at least a level five writer. Yeah. I don't even know what writer classifies in as. I think it's its own class. Is there? Is there a writer in D&D? Scribe. Yeah, Scribe. there, there you we go. go. Yeah, it's one of those commoner classes. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Miniature's handbook exists for a reason. Yeah, she's got a point. The what handbook? Miniature's handbook. Miniature's uh, handbook. Oh, there we go. So you and Patrick are scribes. They're nice. You got your class. Yeah, he's a little higher level than me, I think. <laughs> he's got... Uh, well, I was going to be polite and not say that on air to Brian, but he admitted it. So, he, gets, yeah. he, gets better, uh, he gets better resources than I do. You're, well, thank you. You're very kind. But at the same time, I don't know that I'd want to go up against a guy with a broadsword with a pen, even if it is mightier than the sword. Yeah. <laughs> That that saying was that saying was not made by somebody facing a barbarian. <laughs> no, no. But what if it's a plus nine pen of Vorpal? Well, if it's a magic item, then and it's a regular not, sword, then you're talking about a different. That's a different thing. <laughs> Dagon the Squid God Fountain Pen of Doom. Exactly. Yeah, it like it like casts a, it like quit. casts like the drow like sh- you know shade thing like ha ha. <laughs> The oh. typewriter rhythm of destruction. And now we go into Warehouse 13, ladies and gentlemen, because that's a girl in pose pen. Yes. <laughs> nice. Well, I was just thinking of Riptide from Percy Jackson, where he uncorked the pen, and it is a sword. There you go. So it's mightier than itself. <laughs> speaking of Edgar Allan Poe, yeah. Guy, you can't, uh, now that we're in the, the Halloween season, you, you have to give... Props to Edgar Allan Poe, the uh, the original American horror author. OG horror, yeah, American horror, pretty much the <laughs> guy who created like the uh, the detective story and, and the short story and the short story and the psychological thriller. I mean, as as genres, and it kind of all kind of go back to him. I will say for the record, and I think all my co-conspirators here will agree with me. You know, pe- people tend to think when you talk about Victorian horror, it loses its edge, as it were. Yeah. I think, maybe not everything the man ever wrote, but I think Edgar Allan Poe holds up pretty well. It does, and I think that's why he's still remembered, is a lot of the stuff that he was doing. At the time, it was groundbreaking, but even now that it's become more commonplace, he still did it exceptionally well. Like, you read The Telltale Heart, and it still works. It's still an entertaining story. You know, the, the cast of the Montalado, all of the, all pen, the pendulum, the, pen, the pendulum, the, uh, the black cat, all of these stories that he wrote, they, they deal with the basic essence of like human nature. And I think, and that's why they still, they still work. Apparently uh, PBS is doing a, a special nice. on Ed Allan Poe where they have uh, Dennis, Dennis O'Hare, uh, playing him, the guy that was in uh, True Blood. Cool. I have to say, and I think I think the theme song was "I'm Just a Poor Boy." Nobody <laughs> loves me. I'm just a, a poor boy, boy from a poor family. family. <laughs> yes. Bahamas yes. live from this monstrosity. <laughs> and on that note, let me go because I I did have a previous engagement. Yep, by all means, thanks for calling in. And, and on Thank that you guys one. for having me again. Always good, a pleasure. Good luck. Uh, keep the show going, and uh, hopefully, lots of people. Uh, Tune into the telethon and go to the Patreon and, and pledge lots of money. 
Thank yes. you. Have a good night, Patrick. Send people our way. Thanks. Have a great night, guys. Bye. See ya. <laughs> so that was our friend Patrick Thomas. This is our first surprise guest. So much of a surprise, I didn't even know he was going to call in. <laughs> surprise! <laughs> Not objecting, because I always like hearing from Patrick. It just, I mean, she put it together, didn't tell me until, oh, wait, Patrick's calling. It, it literally <laughs> was like two minutes before we went out air. Nice. Well, we have we have another surprise guest lined up later later on tonight. Either me or Amisha are going to get possessed by a demon. So we're going to have that as a <laughs> live exorcism on live radio. Exorc exorcism on air. It's going to be a great surprise guest. So. <laughs> I am your father. <laughs> no, I'm definitely not a cat demon. That's why he But okay, so let's see. You you're the one who like made notes and everything. I'm just spouting randomness. Yeah. I literally am. So what should, what what do your notes say we should do first? Because I'll pretend to like I'll give lip service to his oh, notes. These are, these are not in order. These yeah. were random things I jotted down that we could do. Uh, so how about a ghost story? A discussion of a time. A ghost story. Obviously, I figured there would be one of those from you. Uh, so yeah, let's let's. I'll tell and... the oldest ghost story. In fact, the oldest ghost story. Okay. Um, granted, there, there are legends of spirits. Predate recorded history. We're pretty sure of that, um, and certainly we know the Babylonians and the Sumerians and everybody else under the sun had spirits. This is going to be told in pictograms. This is the <laughs> oldest in the modern, in the sense that most modern people would think of a ghost story, okay. and it's from ancient Greece, actually. Oh, nice. Now it's recorded in the writings of Pliny the Younger, um, which is of course Roman. But it's about a philosopher who was living in Athens. And I forget, the, he actually names the philosopher. Unfortunately, I do not remember off the top of my head. Most versions of the story don't mention it anyway. Hmm. So this philosopher is living in Athens. He's looking for a room to rent. He can't find somewhere. Finally, he finds this one house. It's, not, it's a whole house well within his price range. Although I, I don't know how much a philosopher made even back then. I doubt it was not. Not, not much. But there's a problem with the house. See, the house is haunted. So, so he's like, he's so frustrated and so grumpy and crotchety as a philosopher. It's like, I'll take it. Perhaps the ghost will be good company for me. I think I remember this story. So he's sitting in, in the room he set up as a study that the first night that he's there. He's like, I'm going to work on a very difficult philosophical question. That way I will not be distracted by stories of ghosts. Because he doesn't really think the house is haunted. And just, you know, the psychology, even sure. back then they kind of understood it. And he's writing well into the night. Because reality is stories are keeping him awake. And he hears this clanking coming from down the hallway and shuffling footsteps. And he decides he's going to ignore it. He just works and works and works. And he gets closer and it gets closer. And it comes into the room. Continues to deliberately ignore it until finally moaning and shaking chains. And he looks up and it's this old man wrapped in chains. Marley? And yeah, kind of. <laughs> so so ki finally he puts his pen down and it's like, Okay, fine. And follows the ghost. The ghost takes him to this little garden in the middle of the house where there's a tree and points to a spot and then vanishes. So our philosopher hero marks the spot on the ground and goes back to bed. And finally goes to bed at this point. The next morning he gets a group of people together and they dig at the spot that he marked. They find a skeleton wrapped in chains. Now, th this illustrates particularly a thing that's very common in Greek mythology about spirits, which is Greeks believe that, yeah, you don't body a bur bury a body right, you get a ghost, and not a happy ghost. There's a, I forget the name of it, but there's a Greek play that's entirely about the ghost of a dead guy trying to get his body buried. Hmm. But that's, a, that's a lot of ancient cultures. This have, is true. Have that belief. It's also how you get vampires. Yes, that's uh, the earlier... Well, if I was doing my uh, my whole lecture thing, I would talk about the similarities between vampire legends, ghosts legends, and werewolf legends, but and demon and legends and demon legends and witch legends. They all kind of fairy blur. legends. They all kind of blur uh, back in the old days. I mean, there are cultures where you have a degree of separation. Six, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> Slash. But like. I'm here all week, folks. It's in particular, like, you look at vampires and werewolves. When a werewolf dies, it becomes a vampire. For, only, only in Greece. I thought that was in some parts of Eastern Europe as well. No, mostly uh, mostly that was a Greek uh, legend, a very specific kind of werewolf. But in general, yeah, witches, witches, very vague. Are vampires 
ghosts or vampires, physical beings or vampires, fairies or vampires, demons, are or, or demon spirit or, or fairy spirits of the dead. <laughs> yes. In some Celtic legends, fairies are the souls of, un, of the unbaptized dead. And which they come from under the mound, which is what uh, their their name in in that culture uh, means. And under the mound meaning you know the underworld. And if you all remember your Odyssey, yes. that um, Odysseus feeds the ghosts blood to get them to be able to speak. Yes, ghosts often were uh, and ancestors and other spirits were often uh, made. Uh, given offerings of blood in order to impart uh, wisdom and so there's a story i should tell because i didn't get to tell it this weekend all right or no i did get to tell it this past weekend the story of stingy jack oh stingy jack so it's halloween time we need to tell the story of stingy jack or as he sometimes known will of a wisp or of course as he sometimes best known jack of the lantern Aww. this is where why we do the whole pumpkin carving thing, ladies and gentlemen. It's an Irish folktale about a man creatively named Stingy Jack. Although what's funny is I noticed from your last telling of the story, him being stingy plays no part in the story at all. Well, it is kind of why the devil gets interested. I guess. Because he's very greedy and you know, he doesn't want to spend money on anything. Yeah. And eventually the devil himself shows up to Stingy Jack. And... Stingy for what, uh, and when basically the devil gets put up in the tree. His memory serves basically it's a bet. You know, you can't climb the tree. Oh, you, the devil, you can't climb the tree. The hooves, it just won't work. <laughs> he climbs the tree, and Stingy carves the sign of the cross into the bark of the tree. Now the devil can't get down. So the two of them argue for a while, and finally the devil agrees. Somehow the devil can't fly. Apparently, oh, his <laughs> wings fell off during the when he, you know, they ripped the wings off when he fell out of heaven. Otherwise, he'd just fly back up to heaven. Oh, you know, silly me. So, <coughs> Sinji will destroy the sign of the cross, but in return, <laughs> hell has no claim over his soul. <laughs> so the devil agrees. Sinji lets him down. Sinji dies. Goes to hell because, well, no, he goes to heaven first. Heaven won't take him because he's kind of an evil dick. And so he, so eventually he makes a long, slow trek, trek downhill to hell. But they can't take him either because the devil has to honor his agreement. Finally, um, he takes, in some versions, he takes a, the coals. Sometimes an angel gives him coals from the fires of hell. And they place these into a gourd. And he carries this to light his way as he walks the earth until judgment day. Now, note I said gourd, not pumpkin. Yes. Pumpkins are a uniquely American vegetable or plant. I don't know which they qualify as. Yes, they only grow in they're, North they're America, a and there's a breed that grows in Japan. Yeah. Which is completely they're different American than American ones. Yes. But that's... I mean, they're kind of smaller and green. That's why we do pumpkins, or in Europe, when they still, still where, they, where they still do it, they do gourds. Although, technically, um, they're a fruit. Ah, because Because the seeds are on the, uh, the inside. Mm. But and that's the thing. As I understand it, Halloween is a much bigger thing in the United States than anywhere else than in Europe. It's also pretty big in Mexico and parts of South America. Yes. But that's the Day of the Dead, which is November first. Yeah, we we kind of our our Halloween tradition kind of evolved from uh, the English Halloween. Well, particularly Irish, because well, Irish, well, Irish, Irish and also and, and English, where yeah, there's yeah. a little bit that they celebrated. It. It's also where we got uh, most of our Christmas. Because apparently Christmas in England used to be uh, much different. Actually, actually More like Halloween. Oh no! Well, yeah, it was actually pretty wild and drunken. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, and we'll we'll talk about this more closer to Christmas. Um, specifically, Santa Claus is primarily German Germanic. Yes, Santa Claus. Um, in point of fact, a quick spoiler for what's coming. The story most of you have probably heard that Coca Cola invented the, our image of Santa Claus is wrong. Ooh. Um, it appears in, technically they're not the Pennsylvania Dutch, because it's the, the ones that landed, that um, lived in New York instead of Pennsylvania. But basically it's the same branch of Germanic people that are the Pens thought of as the Pennsylvania Dutch, which are from Germany, not. So no, not, and yeah, poetry and legends from, Nor from New, New York specifically all describe him as big, bowlful of jelly, red and white, green gloves, 
All the basic, the only element that got added later is the tw the twelve reindeer, which was the poem um, "An Encounter with Saint Nicholas." Yeah, or as we know it, the night before Christmas. Yes. Eight. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, eight. And, then and um, even with tracing it back, I think um, there's some ties into Odin. Yes, you're absolutely um, because right. Because the eight reindeer were essentially supposed to um, represent his the, egg, the eight legs of his steed, whose name is escaping. Sletnir. Sletnir, yes. Yes, because Odin wrote about on an eight-legged horse named Sletnir, who was the so son of Loki. And I might add, Loki gave birth to Sletnir, despite being a dude. Nice. Because Loki's rather Shape weird. changer. Yep. Loki, LGBT friendly since 1000 well, and whatever that. The legend basically goes that the gods hired a giant to build a wall around Asgard. Now, they made a deal with, on Loki's advice, largely, I might add. It's like, oh, he can't build an entire wall. It's like, if you do it, by the end of the, the month, I want to say, or may have been even less time, you can ha you can ma name your name your prices. Like, okay, I want the the hand of Freya, the goddess of love, in marriage. And I was like, okay, yeah, no problem, you got this. Yeah, Loki's like, we got this. Don't worry, it's all good. He'll never do it in time. He'll never do it in time. The guy shows up with a giant horse. And they go, well, crap, because needless to say, he's doing it a record time. So. Loki's like, no, 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 relax, relax. No, I got no this. No one expects the giant horse. I got this. In terms of himself, because he's the, the master of shape changers, changes himself into a female horse and leads the male horse away. So the giant builds the entire wall except for one stone, which therefore means they didn't finish his deal. And Loki shows up not pregnant. <laughs> nice. Um... Most things, it, it pretty much endorsed, but just like in, in Greek mythology, the source of most problems is Zeus couldn't keep it in his pants. In Norse mythology, the problem, the cause of most problems is Loki did something stupid. Loki didn't keep his mouth shut. <laughs> he always found the best ways out of it. Um, though the versions I've heard is that he didn't show back up pregnant. He came back with the steed and explained what happened. I've heard that as well. Well, the thing you run into with folklore because. You'll hear, you know, the story I told of Cindy Jack, the story of Loki, as, as Beth just pointed out. So, any one of a number of Greek myth, myths. The thing you have to run into is the, these are myths. There's often multiple versions. Yes. Depending on different cultures. Because keep in mind, the, what we call the Norse gods were also worshipped by the Germans. Um, well, and, Norse. I mean, Norse basically just means North. Yeah. It was, it was well, yeah, kind of a general term. There's for a Scandinavian the culture is where we think of the Vikings coming from. But the Germans, the Jutes, the Saxons, the Angles worshipped them in Germany and, for that matter, worshipped them in England when they came to England because that was their original gods. Yeah. So you get different variations. You know, Odin, Wotan, depending on which culture you're talking about. Um, that's why they're, it's like when you're talking about Greek, about myth, it's really hard to say, no, that version's wrong because somebody somewhere might have believed it. Oh, yeah. There's a few. It's like, no, that was cre that. Act there are a few that were actually created by advertising and things like that. For example, yes. fun fact, Paul Bunyan, not actual legitimate American folklore. He was created by an advertising agency. Yeah. There's Same thing with Pecos Bill. There's a few of those. On the other, I'll say on the other hand, um, John Henry was based on an actual person, as I yes. understand it. And the other, other classic one was, uh, of course, Johnny Appleseed, which is based on a man Real. by the name of John Chapman. Real guy. Who was a Mormon missionary? Yeah, and did actually walk around distributing know, apple seeds, freaking cap planting apple seeds. Well, yeah, supposedly though it wasn't out of altruism; it was so that he could uh, claim the land. He was also a missionary. I mean, he, his entire purpose was going around preaching the Mormon gospel. Well, there was that. While he was there, he he threw some apple seeds it's on the ground to, to get a legal stake claim. A claim on the land. Yeah. So, but yeah, planted thousands, thousands of acres of. Uh, of new apples in, in America, which made a big uh, difference. Well, for that matter, if we're talking Halloween, the obvious thing we should mention, a little more contemporary, would be, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Halloween is the night that one of my personal heroes, and the reason why you see many of the things in front of me this evening, Harry Houdini died. Ah, yes. Tell, tell us about Houdini. So Houdini is a very interesting character. Um, of course, he's most famous as what they call an escapologist. He could get out of just about everything. 
Um, for fun, for funsies, the man traveled around the United States and Europe, getting police officers to lock, lock him in, up in various handcuffs and then getting out of them. And being locked up in jail cells. Yeah. Also uh, something of a spiritual debunker. Which is, actually, there's the interesting thing. So Houdini got in, Houdini was the original mama's boy in so many ways. He was obsessed with his mother. He freely, if you read his book, and I recommend it, A Magician Amongst the Spirits, he freely admits to being a massive mama's boy. When his mama died, he was de absolutely devastated. And he went around to spiritualists to try to contact her. Unfortunately, every single one he ever went to was a fraud, using tricks he knew because he used them in his stage routines. Because yes. everyone, I've had people argue with me. It's like, Houdini wasn't a magician, he was an escape artist. No, he was both. Yeah. Um, he was just primarily known as an escape artist. Because that's what the big grand thing is. Well, yeah. Yeah. He also had a brother who, uh, lesser, much lesser known, uh, they, they portrayed him in uh, Boardwalk Empire rather well. It was funny. But uh, yeah, his. His poor brother, who uh, he rather largely overshadowed, who was also a uh, stage magician. Though he wanted doing something else, I forget. Yeah, I think he well, finally threw in the towel because he just wasn't. Because originally, Wake, when they were very, very young, they actually started out working together. Yeah, and the one just wasn't, uh, what was his name? Hit? I don't remember. Houdani, I think he called himself, or. I don't know. I Well, his actual name would have been something or other Weiss. <sighs> right, but he took the stage name. Uh, Houdani. Houdani or something. It was it's close enough to Houdini. But... So at any rate, um, Houdini, died, like I said, died on Halloween. Um, most people are actually quite wrong about how he died. Because most people think he got punched in the stomach by a man by the name of Jay Gordon Whitehead. Which is true. He, um, he did get punched very hard in the stomach by a college boxer by the name of Jay Gordon Whitehead. There's actually some evidence... That White um, Whitehead had been uh, a spiritualist, or at least a believer in the spiritualist movement, um, because the people that were there when Gordon decided to lay in on, on Houdini, who starts a, he starts asking Houdini, it's like, well, you don't believe in spiritualism, yeah, but how can you say that? Do you believe in the miracles of the Bible? And Houdini was just confused by this, and the you know, guy is angrily quizzing him. And then finally, he's like, so I hear you can take a punch to the stomach, which was true as part one of the things he'd do in his stage routines is he'd invite professional boxers up on stage to punch him in the gut. Right, but he had to prepare. He had excellent muscle control. He could flex his muscles in such a way that it felt like punching a tree trunk. Not so much as Houdini himself was in phenomenal shape. Yeah, but he didn't he have like a burst appendix or something? Well, uh, I'm getting there. Okay. So Houdini's laying on his couch reading his mail, and Gordon just... Jay Gordon just goes up and starts punching him in the stomach hard. Um, the other two guys in the room actually physically pull him off of Houdini. And then when, you know, Houdini takes the moment, he flexes, and Gordon tries it again and describes it as like hitting a tree trunk. Hmm. Um, now, what ha actually happens here is Houdini has appendicitis at this time. Um, for, for the record, being punched in the gut did not cause appendicitis. That's not how appendicitis works. It's a bacterial infection. What happens is the extreme pain he feels in his chest, he is so, especially because it's on the wrong side of his body, um, because the appendix is on, I want to say, the left. I think so. And the pain's on his right, or it's on the right, and he feels it on his left. Um, he doesn't associate it with appendicitis. He assumes it's from being punched, and he doesn't go to the doctor. Now, he's going to, he's traveling to a show, and he he's incredibly sick. He's vomiting. He's in intense pain. He's vomiting blood, in fact. And he's going to cancel and go to the doctor. But the guy who's, who's hosting it, the, the theater owner, is like, Houdini, you can't do this to me. You know, they know that Houdini is coming. Pe the last time you had to cancel like this, there were riots in the streets. We can't allow that. And Houdini, being the consummate professional, is like, nope, the show must go on. He does it, and his appendix ruptures. And he spends the next, I want to say, week fighting back and forth against the fact that his appendix ruptured develops uh, what's called peritonitis. And there's a big, all through the media, will Houdini survive? Will he beat death? And then on Halloween night during a performance, it finally catches up to him and he would die in the hospital. He did not die. The other common myth is that he died in the water torture. No, 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 no. The, it finally got so severe he had to, he was running a massive fever and he had to be rushed to the hospital during the water torture routine. The water torture routine did not kill him. Getting punched in the stomach did not kill him. There is a theory that's making the rounds today, uh, particularly because of a book called The Secret Life of Harry Houdini, 
that suggests he may have been poisoned by the spiritualist movement, because there's a number of spiritualists, particularly one by the name of Marjorie, who threatened his life, or their spirit, or specifically in Marjorie's case, her spirit guide threatened Houdini's life. It wasn't me, it was my spirit guide. Oh. Um. It's like the, like that little kid blaming everything on the imaginary yeah. friend. Well, it's it's also a great was also a, tactic. Because a male voice that was speaking, so it clearly couldn't have been this right. young, f attractive female woman who liked to do her, her seances in the nude. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, but see, the thing is, again, if you actually threaten somebody, you're liable to, uh, you know, for criminal Terrorist prosecution. Uh, you know, if, if your spirit guide threatens someone, well, then, you know... <sighs> The they, law does not recognize the existence have to, of the spirit. They have world. to arrest the spirit guy. <laughs> and lots of luck there. <laughs> oh. I was actually um, watching Lore the other night with a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And it was the episode where they were talking about seances. Oh. And they actually had mentioned that when Houdini's mother had passed away, he had gone to a seance. And this is actually what kicked off his debunking of the spiritualist movement. Um, the woman said she was getting a message and started writing down something, but he knew immediately that she was a fraud because she was writing it in English. Yes. Yes. In fact, I can tell you who the woman was. So, um, this is not actually what got him started. I, I've heard that too, but having, based on his own book, it was an ongoing process before that particular event happened. It makes sense. That, that was the last straw. He's doing a show in England. And a uh, somewhat well-known, a few of our listeners might have heard of him. Gentleman, a knight, in fact, comes up to Houdini after the show and introduces himself. And they start actually what turns out to be a very close friendship. And the basis for a television series. Yes. So the, the close friend of Houdini to, to his dying day, and from Houdini's book on the subject, Houdini had a lot of respect for the man from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the man who wrote Sherlock Holmes' book on the subject. The respect was kind of one way. Um... But it was actually the Lady Doyle, who herself was a spiritualist, who um, he, Bess, his wife, who was also very devoted to, Arthur and Bess and Lady Doyle were all hanging out. And the Lady Doyle's like, why don't I try and reach your mom? Let's see what happens. And Houdini and Doyle leave the room, so it's just, or no, Bess and Doyle leave the room, so it's just Houdini and the Lady Doyle. And Houdini had done a mentalism act with Bess in the past, so they had a whole code to communicate with each other without speaking, where Bess explains that the night before all this had happened, she and the Lady Doyle had a conversation about Houdini's mother. Mm -hmm. So the Lady Doyle writes out this letter in English. So there's three problems with the letter. The first problem is at the top of the page, the Lady Doyle draws the sign of the cross. The problem being, um, Houdini himself and his wife, and his or I don't know about his wife, but and his mother were devout Jews. Yes. A Jewish woman is not going to draw the sign of a cross on something. Do you hear banging? Is there everything okay? Do you hear banging? That something probably was me. No, something just shook the back part there. I felt it over here. Uh -oh. Weird. I watch equipment shake. Houdini's here. Um, they tried that for 10 years. He never came. They still do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for anyone who's interested, my friend Dorothy Dietrich, who is going to be a guest in the near future, does a yearly Halloween Houdini seance in New York. It is, as far as I know, free to the public. I have to work or I'd be going myself. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, Dorothy Dietrich, who sometimes is a magician known as the lady, the female Houdini, also has a wonderful Houdini museum in Scranton, Pennsylvania, I highly recommend people check out. And is also famous for doing a trick that Harry Houdini bowed out of doing. Which is the bullet catch. To be fair, for perfectly reasonable reasons. No. By Houdini's day, 12 people trying to do the bullet catch died. He was going to do it, but his friends in the magical community went, you can't do this. If you try to do this, somebody, you know, one of your many enemies, because this was deep into the spirit, his war against the spiritualists, is going to thought, use it to take you out. So the, the other two problems with the letter, because Doyle has a pretty reasonable explanation for why the cross is there. He explains that Lady Doyle, and for that matter, all the spiritualists he knows, because most of the people at this time, because we're talking about the 1930s, are Christian, draw the sign of the cross as a protective thing. It's not the spirit doing it, it's Lady Doyle. 
Now, the second problem is it's in perfect English. Yeah. While uh, Houdini's mother had lived in the United States for many years, she had never spoken English day in her life. Exactly. Or actually, there's four problems. I just remember another one. I, um, the next problem is it calls him Harry. Yes. Harry's birth name is not Harry Houdini. It is Eric Weiss. And it's not what she called him. But uh, and he, granted, he legally adopted the stage name of Harry sure. Houdini. But there's also the one other glaring mistake. So the letter is completely lacking any personal details. It is incredible. You can find it in Houdini's book or you can find it online. It is incredibly general. It's, oh, my darling boy, I finally reached you. After all this time, I've been trying to reach you. Da, 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 da. But that's it. That's all it does. It's the standard stuff you hear from mediums and, spirit and psychics all the time in the real world. Now, most importantly, See, by coincidence, not by design, it was kind of a special day for Houdini and kind of a special day for Mom. The letter was written on his mother's birthday. No mention of the fact it was Mom's birthday. Right. Hadn't uh, Houdini also set up uh, with her some kind of a... No, no, no. Code? He set up with his wife, not with his mother. Oh, okay, because I always heard before she died that uh, he, he told her or she told him some particular thing that she would use to verify, like, so he would know that it was... No, Houdini right. set up a code with his wife, Bess, that in the event of his death, he would give this code. And okay. The code has actually since been publicly revealed. I forget what it is. Right. So that he, she would know it was him. Um, there are other measures that he set up. So if the, the Houdini seance ever reaches Houdini, they can verify it. Um, but who, on the uh, for 10 years after he died... She held the Halloween seance to try to reach him. The final year, the final time that she did it before she passed it off to others, and it's most recently fallen to Dorothy Diedrich, was on top of the Knickerbocker Hotel in New York. She had a, a picture of him with a candle burning in front of it. At the end of the seance, she said, 10 years is enough to wait for any man, and blew out the candle. At the same moment, a huge windstorm started up around the building, which some people have jokingly, if nothing else, Suggested was Houdini saying, yeah, it's over. <laughs> I'm out. But yeah, um, Dorothy does still try to do it. And to her, you know, much respect to her, they play it straight. They're honestly trying to see if they can reach him. Lots of other people have even, a bunch of people have even tried to claim to reach Houdini himself. But nobody's ever been able to prove it. Um, one, well, that's our first hour. Yeah, I was going to say, one, that we've reached our first hour. I'm going to give the fun number out again, but I want to give one more interesting fact about Houdini that's not necessarily well known. Okay. So when you think of skeptics today, like people like James Randi or, or Penn and Teller, they're all atheists. You know, James, the amazing Randi, James Randi, has always been very clear he doesn't believe in God, nor does he have a whole lot of patience for people who do. Houdini was devoutly religious. He, you know, if you read his book, A Magician Amongst the Spirits, he starts out by saying, I firmly believe in the existence of life after death. I believe there's a life after life. He did not believe in the ability to communicate with it. Or at the very least, it very much lost his ability to believe in it. Yeah. Because that, that's the other thing. He started, he was originally the, the um, poster on Fox Mulder's wall. I want to believe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was very curious about it. So let's give out the number again. It's 609-807-2492, 609-807-2492. Feel free to call in if you got a question, if you got a comment. If you just want to make fun of us, that's okay, too. Yes. <laughs> or compliment me on my awesome coat. And then shall we do the Dracula versus the stat as the next thing? Uh, yeah, we could do that. I think we need a, uh, I think we need a moment. I need to... Uh, Finish getting take, into character. Take a quick break. And I need to put on my cape. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Amisha, do you, do you and Beth want to want to hold things over? Well, I was going to say, well, you do that. I can always do a trick. Oh, you can do that too. All right. I will be back. Whatever you want to do. Okay. So here we go. We have our lovely crystal ball that people may have been wondering about all evening. Well, not exactly crystal. No. Oh, yeah, it's metal, but or possibly plastic. I'm not entirely sure. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to have, cover it up because, of course, as everyone knows, ghosts like to work in the dark and see what happens. <laughs> see? Just 
an ordinary ball. I'm still working on that one. Okay. Uh, okay, let's do this. Beth, come on up. Everybody even get to see our producer. Now, before I do this, again, I'm going to stick my sword through Beth's neck. Now, in case you think... I can't watch, by the way. You can't watch? No, I can't watch. Legal... So in case you think it's a trick color, let me be clear. I can't watch. <laughs> it's quite real. If I had a piece of paper, I could even cut it up a bit. Uh, but I want I don't want anybody to worry. I promise that this will not hurt me one bit. <laughs> this is my Highlander scene, everybody. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to step away from the microphone to do this, so you'll just watch. Uh, no, it's not easy. I actually have some uh, Our semi-willing uh, victim. Hi, good, Brian. Just in, in time for the execution. Nope. Like being a bigger thing, so it's just like me. <laughs> <laughs> we work with what we have. Oh, sorry. That was yeah, I was. Much easier right to do this with you with my left big tail. Oh, I'm not sure that one. I can use. I just need some. Nobody touches you. See? Nobody touches you. Okay, so. Oh. Yeah. Ready? Do you feel anything yet? No. You should feel a little bit of poking. Do you feel it? That sounds real. Oh god. I feel now, crazy. Now do us a nice turn. As everyone can see. I, I we gotta take, take, take a look. I'm gonna look at it. Come okay. on, let's show Gene. You got a little something. Oh my god. You got a little something in your throat. She's got a little something in her throat. Yeah. I think that's cold that's been going around. It's just melting. Yeah. Just he was sick all weekend. Oh my yeah. god. You gave it to me. It's all your fault. Oh so goodness. let's see. Because I don't want to leave our producer dying. Oh my One god. and the two oh and the. Oh my god. Dun, dun, dun. See, I told you it hurt me all. <laughs> and she's not dead. Yeah. You had bad days? I feel happy. I feel happy. She's only mostly dead. <laughs> she's getting better. <laughs> You're not fooling anyone. Careful, I'll turn you into a newt. <laughs> I felt better. Uh, one of these days, we'll just do an entire episode of the Monty, Monty, Python, Monty references. Python references. Yeah. And I assume we'll spread out. All right, I need my the Holy Grail. Yeah, we'll just we'll just be yeah. everywhere. One more thing, because I need my cake. Oh, yes. Why did you Dracula? Dracula wears a cake. Get your get your silly. Hey, uh, Kevin, check cake. this out, Kevin. Yeah. Show it before yours, no problem, right? Remember? And now it's going weird. There's 40 pups in there. 40 pups. Pups are uh, proactive uh, uh, programs that come from different parts of the internet. Mm -hmm. And now there's 40 of them in there that keep shutting the software off. <laughs> and nothing has been done. We're full of pups. We're puplerific. <laughs> swear to God. So my oh, the like official said. TM Dracula cake. Uh, pump me dun, dun, dun. Programs. There's only a real vampire can pull off pink. Oh, uh, okay. Before you guys get into this, I'm actually not feeling well, so I'm going to lay over in the car. Okay, sweet. You feel not feeling That's well? Oh, sorry. Yeah, we've all been getting sick, I think. It's Brian's fault. Yes. It's all your fault. Okay, are we ready to do this? Yes. So do you want to get us started? We'll let the, the inferior vampire go first. Oh, then by all means. <laughs> Please begin. <laughs> For, first of all, my apologies. Uh, I am not uh, the vampire Lestat, as, uh, as, was, <laughs> as was advertised. Uh, my name yeah, is nice Louis nice. Le Pontelac. <laughs> I have been sent here as uh, Dracula, or, sorry, not Dracula, uh, Lestat's proxy. You ain't good enough to be my proxy. Oh, What's so, so uh, before before I begin, I would like to uh, read a prepared statement that uh, my my esteemed colleague has has written and asked that I read on his behalf. <clears throat> Dear Dracula, I know I promised to come and debate you, but I've changed my mind. I'm capricious like that. I have far cooler things to do than exchange insults with an overhyped, out of date, pitiful relic such as you. 
I am therefore sending Louie here to do it for me. You two deserve each other. Having fabulous, sexy adventures somewhere else, Lestat the Lion Card. P.S. <laughs> see, see, and this is just my point. L Lestat is a poser. Is that, is that supposed to be a uh, Romanian or Transylvanian? Uh, give, give me time. We'll get there. <laughs> I'm usually better at the Romanian accent, but right now I, I'm not channeling it quite right. So give everybody just give me a minute, and hopefully I'll I'll get dinged with the mood. Just think of Bella Lagos. Indeed. <laughs> but well, first, so, should we go back and forth in like small segments? Well, you got your opening statement. I think I, well, I have. I have. Uh, yeah, I divided it up into bits in case we went back and forth. Well, like a proper better. debate, you got yeah. your introduction. Now I get mine. Certainly. Now, no one can deny that Lestat has popularized the genre of late, but it's New Coke versus Coke Classic. <laughs> Which would you prefer, the imitation and the poor imitation of that, at that? <laughs> I mean, he's he's called by his dubiously talented, what's the word I'm looking for, chronicler, the brat prince. Do you want the brat prince or the prince of dark? Do you want the pretty boy from Louisiana or the Count from Transylvania? Did you have something to say? <laughs> oh, I was just uh, <clears throat> I was just answering your questions. <laughs> so, let's see. Dracula. You have one book. Maybe two, if you can, if you count the uh, the sequel that was written many, many, almost a century after your after his death, uh, you were killed by a cowboy with a knife. Very scary. Lestat, on the other hand, has never died. Has nearly twenty books chronicling him and his friends, all bestsellers. Dracula, as I recall, did fairly mediocre business upon its uh, publication. So really, when you think about it, most of your success came after, long after, from things like movies and other people taking you and spinning you around. So really, you're not, you're not the king of the vampires. You're the king of fan fiction. Sure. Sure. Lestat, on the other hand, is a genuine rock star. Ah, but was it because he only had one book to write, or was it because... He had said everything that needed to be said. Anne Rice has this desperate need to go on and on and on with this, let's face it, Gary Stew of a character. I mean, could he be over, any more overhyped? And yeah, yeah, yes, you, you could argue that with my many powers, I am a little overpowered myself, but I am the villain. I am not the hero or the main character. I am not the, how you say, Superman. I am the dark side. I'm the one that tried to kill. And granted, I got, I got killed by a Texan with a Bowie knife. But, you know, if any kind of American was going to kill me, what other than a Texan? Well, it's that when he dies, will probably die of ennui or some equally lame thing like that. No, no, that's me. <laughs> to kill me, they had to bring in. They couldn't. An Englishman couldn't do the job. They had to bring in, bring in Texan <laughs> with a honk and big knife. I might add. Plus, you know how it is. I had just woken up, and when I wake up, you're a little cranky, a little out of it. Uh -huh. In a real fight, I could have totally taken him. Sure. So your your many many powers. Let's see. You can you can turn into a dog. A wolf. You, you can turn into a bat, fly around like a little, beep, 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 control beep, the weather, beep, 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 beep. somewhat control the weather. You can turn into a mist. That's that's spooky. Um, you can hypnotize vulnerable women. You can. Uh, that's about it. Control animals. Oh, oh! You're the the Aquaman of the vampire world. 
You ever been attacked by a wolf, Louie? <laughs> I have, actually. I can, I can rip my arms. Crosses, oh, it, it, holy it, it, wafers, garlic, running water, and sleeping in the dirt are some really lame weaknesses. Lestat, as you said, has almost no weaknesses. Even the sun he can fly around in now because he's drank from, remember from the a book. goddess. Remember the book instead of the movies. Oh, no, I, Sunlight I doesn't stop me either. And I didn't need to drink a goddess to become even more overpowered. <laughs> and I understand that, but you have to turn into a bat to, to fly. Lestat can just Superman around. But getting um, control of the weather? At all? Uh, I can definitely control the weather. The book's quite clear I can control the weather. He's insisted, to? in fairness, given the fact, I might add, there are more adaptations of my story than any other character in the English language. King of fan fiction. The only character who comes close which is the only the human that is most adapted would be Sherlock Holmes, yes. and I be I fought him too. <laughs> yes, you fought everybody over the years and lost most of the time. Well, of course, because you want to prove your kind of if you want to prove your character is a badass, do you send them against the Brat Prince or do you send them against Dracula, baby? Well, because the stat would win. That's that's the problem. Dracula always gets beaten. You're you're sort of like the Lieutenant Worf. Of the vampires, you know, you you get you get hyped up and made a uh, big game, but then the real point is they come in and they slap you around to show them how show how tough they are. Um, well, Stats a pretty boy. It wouldn't be that hard to beat him. He is a pretty boy. I know that. Um, however, I have a small list here of uh, people who have who have beaten you: uh, Buffy, Billy the Kid, Abbott and Costello, the Monster Squad, uh, some Wolf Men. Uh, you've been killed in a carriage accident a few times. A rose bush. Couldn't, couldn't get the best of a rose bush. And an old man with a stick on, on several occasions. Has anybody ever tried the stick on Lestat? Yes, actually, uh, in, in uh, Vampire Mary Lestat. Mary Sue. No, no, no. He woke up with his hand crushing the man's throat while he slept, he didn't even have to wake up to take out the vampire hunter. There was the guy with the stake in one hand and the, and the, uh, the hammer in the other hanging dead from the stat's hand while he slept. Of course, I would point That's out, how cool since you've brought in the adaptations, we have to point out, no matter who kills me, I keep coming back. Yes, you always come back like a bad penny. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Um, here's, here's a little something. Uh, Dracula has to hypnotize or, uh, or bite uh, to get his girl, whereas uh, women flock to Lestat, which, you know, in the modern age, you know, not, not too cool. Dracula, you have your three brainless wives, quote-unquote, that you keep locked up and feed babies to. Not cool, you misogynistic pig. Lestat treats women as equal partners and even uh, has dated a queen, Embraced his own mother. Equal rights. Lestat also has groupies. Yes, yes he does. I have better groupies. taste. Lestat has genuine groupies. You have to like hypnotize and uh, break into women's houses in the middle of the night. Well, that's because real vampires require permission. They don't just go wherever they want. <laughs> Besides requiring permission, excuse me, I'm nobility. It's polite. You know, Lestat's nobility too. Not uh, barely. He doesn't, he doesn't. He doesn't flaunt it around like some people with, uh, you know, count of. He of barely where, earned the title. Where, where are you count of? Actually, like, what do you do? Is that even a legitimate title, or is that just a self-styled thing? Transylvania. I didn't think Transylvania. Transylvania was a county. But. It's, well, it was. It is. It, it's a much older definition than a county. <laughs> Now, if we want to get historically ta accurate, the, the title would be Voivod, which would be more akin to a warlord or perhaps prince than a count. Yes. But, I was, but uh, now, if we want to go no mortal land, you have to concede I would take Lestat in the butt. As, as a mortal, I don't know. He was actually quite, uh, quite a formidable warrior, if you read the book. Uh, he killed a wolf single-handedly, Without weapons. It took mortal. six men to kill me when I died. And they're not even sure that actually did the job. I thought that was Rasputin. Oh, no, that's overhyped, actually. 
Rasputin, Rasputin's killers wanted to make themselves sound more badass than they actually were, so they claimed it took all these crazy things to kill Rasputin. It wasn't that hard. Oh, okay. But in, in point of Let's fact... Just beheaded? Yeah. Well, he was, no, he was shot, stab, shot, stabbed, poisoned, got rooted, and drowned. Ah, and I no, believe I mean, actually the bullets killed him. I mean, Dracula, wasn't he just... Uh, no, um, that wasn't how... Nobody's like quite sure how they killed him. How oh, they killed me. Beheaded. Um, I can't reveal how they killed me, of course, because that's trade secrets. Uh -huh. But to give you an idea of how badass a vampire I am compared to the pretty boy... When I was killed, my head was removed from my body and taken back to Mehmed II, the Sultan of the Turks, to prove that I was dead. And I still came back. Okay. Well, to they I... took Lestat's head off. Do you think he'd survive? Yes. And we put it in another country? That, that How is... would he come back? How would he come back? I don't know, but he always does. Much to my uh, consternation. Are you complaining about how I treat my victims? Look at what he did to you. Well, I've read the book. As as he likes to put it, I asked for it, so uh, I can I only have myself to blame. But speaking of, uh, I wanted to get back to one of the points you made. Um, you were talking about New Orleans versus Transylvania. I'm I'm sorry, but any day of the week and twice on Sunday, New Orleans, the city of Mardi Gras and beignets and gumbo and jazz versus Transylvania, smelly peasants picturesque mountains and a whole lot Fantastic of food. to do. I, I think I would have to pick New Orleans any day, and I think most... But uh, Lestat is... By, last I checked, New Orleans is not a monarchy. Lestat is not a noble New Orleans. No, no. He was he was a, a member of the French aristocracy so, uh, before he was embraced. And you got, you got to keep up, keep up with the times, Louis. Yes, I was the Council in Transylvania. I moved on. I was in London. Oh, so what are you now, the, the Earl? Earl Dracula? <laughs> the Prince Dra Prince of Darkness. Oh. Keep up. Well, Lestat in his latest book is called Prince Lestat. He's Again. He's Prince. Because Lestat is essentially fan fiction. No, you're, you are. I have fan become fan fiction. fan fiction. Lestat was Anne Rice's, Rice's attempt to work out her own psychological issues in the form of a book. Well... In that case, at least, Lestat is a and complicated, three-dimensional character, while Dracula, you're something of a one-note creeper. I'm an actual villain where Lestat is just an annoying annoyance. No, he's an anti-hero. He's not even an anti-hero. He's, he's more like it's an, one of those gnats that bounces around your head and is really <laughs> annoying, but he's not even worth swatting because he's just that minor. Gadfly? Not, not quite. <laughs> I, I, would, I would not agree. I would not agree. And Dracula is a loner, except for slaves. Again, not not cool in the modern age. You're, you're talking about keeping up with the times. Got to got to get a little less a uh, little less un PC there, Dracula. <laughs> Lestat, on the other hand, has a delightful entourage of colorful characters, including myself. Uh, I must say, um, you hang out in cemeteries, decrepit castles. And run down shabby abbeys. Lestat, meanwhile, can be found kicking it in elegant mansions, penthouses, and bordellos. Where would you rather hang out, I ask you, if you're going to be a vampire? Well, last I checked, there is no Lestat twist. twist. There is a Transylvania twist. No, Lestat has his own ball in uh, New Orleans every year. Attended more, by thousands. More uh, of the lady from New Orleans need to fan her own self-importance. It's not even her doing. It's purely, purely the fans. Fan. Dracula, as I recall, if we're going to go by fans, there's a Dracula ball or ten <laughs> around the country, around the world. As opposed to, how many places have a list that ball outside of New Orleans? You only need one if it's that good. If it's that good, more people would copy it. Plus, I think the ultimate condemnation uh, of you is that thanks to you and your various incarnations, we've had to put up with decades of blah blah. I want to suck your blood, which is not my fault. Yes, Even Belor himself did not speak like that. You are you are the worst stereotype of of vampire kind. But because of if we're going to go there, fine. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have to put up with sparkly vampires. That's not true. 
It's totally true. Riven and uh, Varney and a lot most of, of had uh, most of whom no Stephanie Meyer had never heard of either of those characters, and you know it. And, it, and they didn't get sparkly, self-important vampires from me. Oh, we got a caller. All right. Well, let's let's leave it at that. Then, callers, you you can decide who won that uh, that debate. Hello. 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 Hi, this is DJ Danny. I was actually just trying to reach my father to let him know I was done work, but he didn't want to pick up the phone. Oh, shame well, on you. Well, that's awkward. Now, so, I now called him out, ten times, too. Now it's in front of everybody. So, DJ Danny, who's the better vampire, Dracula or Lestat? <laughs> Dracula? Ha! Un uninformed opinions. <laughs> That's two to zero so far. You didn't, you didn't hear the debate. I think I wiped the floor with him. I so did not. Two to zero. Patrick agreed with me. Right? Beth, who, who do you think is the better vampire? Let's pick on our studio audience. Well, what do you prefer? I prefer Dracula, no question. I, I, I was championing Lestat. I mostly just know about Dracula, so that's who I would prefer. <laughs> Beth, you need to weigh in. If you got a chance to date both, your answer would change. <laughs> Lestat is a far more considerate. Uh, but if you partner. want a proper villain, you want Dracula. You don't want Lestat. Oh, as a villain, sure. sure. Absolutely. If you want, a, want an annoying, pain in the rear end, brat, anti, anti hero, you go with Lestat. And eventually you get bored with it and you go find somebody else. No, you primarily <laughs> use Claudia and then just throw her under the bus. Yep. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still here. Sorry, I'm counting my drawer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rhetoric. So, Beth, you still need to weigh in. Dragon Lil is that? It'll be Dra uh, Vladdy Boy. Hands down. And she heard the debate. Main, main reason is because if you take legitimate wall human um, ranking... Vladdy, uh, rather, Dracula still outweighs Lestat by a mile. Yeah. Um, and quite frankly, as a human, and then um, even with the the supposed reign of terror by canon that Dracula had, Dracula did a lot more work overall. Whereas Lestat pretty much just kind of faded in and out whenever he wanted to and was pretty much being, you know, I'm just going to go curl over here, over there, go over here, go over here. And he's just lady as 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 like a fifteen. He know, said some little, incredible little, little, like He went to heaven and girl, hell, trying to figure out what she wants. But to even get the other characters in his own novel argued that that was just the spirit screwing with Lasad. Maybe they they say maybe it was. Maybe it was the real devil. I'm inclined to think it was just the spirit screwing with Lasad. It could have been. Could have been the real <laughs> devil. <laughs> so everyone, take Danny off the hook and let her talk to Jean. I'll be. I'm coming. I'm on my way. I mean, like, Jean's Tori could have just called me back. Yeah, you know, you, you know, look, you could wait. <laughs> Smack All right, later. I'll see him soon. Oh. I gotta go. <laughs> yeah. All right, bye, guys. Have a good time. Well, yeah, Thank you. Cool. Uh, what, about, what about you? Two calls. What about Patrick? the other members of our studio audience? Did I convince either of you that Lestat was cooler than, uh... Wait, what was the question? Who is the cooler Lestat vampire, Dracula or Lestat? That's a toss-up there. I see. But, all right. Let me actually, um, and what tense? Let's say, like, say, like, in, uh... Start with the classic. Oh, Who would win a fight? No, the, the fight thing is overrated. We, we were doing it over. And Dragon Lee so. would easily win in the fight. Not necessarily. <laughs> easily. I, I, I would say, very much I would say Dracula, because if he gets, if Dracula gets set in the proper position <laughs> to bite him, then he becomes him. Maybe. Just like, you know, like the zombie thing, if I went and bit you on the shoulder, then you become no, no, a zombie. No, no, no. Uh, the vampires, you can, um, well, also, by, by canon, Dracula would probably break his teeth on Lestat's skin. True. Yes, it does have stuff. Skin. They, they, get, uh, they, they get to the point of being like almost like marble. But mm. in a straight fight, I mean, Dracula in has strength. Fight? Yeah. Dracula has speed. Dracula Lestat has more of both. Well, here's, I wouldn't agree with that here, at all. Here's a little devil's, here's a little devil's advocate. On what time of the day? It really doesn't matter because... Because they both, can both operate during both, the day. Both have gotten to the point where they can go out during the day. day? Yeah. Okay. If we're going by Vlad the Impaler, he was a master level warrior in life. With 400 if, to 500 years of practice, 
<laughs> now with the speed and strength of a vampire, I will grant you that I think Lestat is faster. I think they're probably on even terms in terms of raw strength. Uh, maybe. I don't know. In the original book, it never seemed to me that Dracula was... He's described as memory serves strong. as being as strong as 20 men. Hmm. It's definitely emphasized that he's very strong. And while he cannot shapeshift during day, he does maintain his strength. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying he gets taken out by a small band of... When he had just woke, literally time. just woken up. Yeah, but so what? And it was a Texan! Like I said, <laughs> Lestat would have killed that Texan in his sleep. Like, literally. Well, here's the thing. The uh, Texan had a crazy, psychotic... Um, you know, devout, fanatical, zealotous Austrian backing him, and that essentially is like um, yeah. a Marshall's boost to <laughs> all of his stats. Yeah. So he, he had a bit of help. A little bit, but Van, also, Van Helsing gets gets overhyped as well. I mean, when you think about it, this is a this, this is, is a bookworm. <laughs> this is a doctor that didn't didn't know that. Uh, Although Trace, he does kill the three brides. Well, yeah, but he also didn't. He also probably killed uh, Lucy because. He didn't know enough to know that uh, mixing various people's bloods into one transfusion. In fairness, you know, nobody knew at the time. That wasn't discovered until after Dracula was written. Yeah. So, th so citing that is completely unfair. It's like, <laughs> no, no. I'm sorry. Saying he doesn't know the future isn't really reasonable. Yeah, the concept of types wasn't even um, conceived until um, Doyle started doing it with um, Sherlock Holmes, and even then. It was only theorized by Sherlock. It wasn't even a concept when uh, Stoke was writing. True. But she still would have died. <laughs> Which is one of the theories some of the fictions explored is that yes. no, Dracula was, right, was trying to save her life because Von Helsing kept screwing things up by giving her blood transfusions from different men. Yeah, the, uh, the Dracula tapes. Uh, Version where a few other ones, but that's probably the most prominent. Fred Saberhagen, yeah, uh, that one was that one was fun. So again, let's give the numbers again in case anybody else wants to call and weigh in on this. Yes. Six zero nine eight zero seven two four nine two six zero nine eight zero seven two four nine two. Who is the better vampire, Dracula or the Stat? Who could beat up who? Whose daddy could beat up whose daddy? Oh well. We don't know who Dracula's daddy is, but Marius is pretty damn tough. Actually, uh, no, no, actually, my money's again on Dracula's daddy because the very, well, it's never directly straight it's stated. The very strong implication in the novel is that he made a pact with Satan directly. Hmm. And I'm sorry, I'm sure Marius is very ba badass, but my money's on the devil himself. Well, if, if you go by that. Which is what's a, as close to the canon as there is, and is what's referred to at all in the book. Yeah. Are you guys referring to like Maker Daddy, as far as like who turned who? I originally meant the original actual Baby Daddy, but apparently um, well, it's turned into original turned Baby who. Daddy. I, my money would be on uh, Dracula's father. Dracula. Um, Dr Dracula's father. Um, however, I would. Yeah. Well, no, his father's name was. Dr yeah. Um, Common mistake. His father's name is Dracula. No, my 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 brain is a seven at this time. It's night. okay. Um, but however, but I would also say. Well, well I, I would also <laughs> say. That for, um, even for whoever made who, mm -hmm. whatever have you, um, Marius was not Lestat's maker. He was somebody who oh, helped him with right. his... Magnus. Yeah. Magnus was um, Lestat's maker. And he wasn't even around for that long before he turned him. But he, was, he was around for a while, long enough to become disillusioned with the whole vampire thing. And I think it was like less than a century. He made Lestat and then he... Like pretty much set himself on fire. But again, over, the devil himself. Well, that's if you go by that. Again, going by the novel, the devil himself. Hmm. And I'm sorry, as close as you get to canon is the original novel. <laughs> <laughs> so what else did you have written down? Of course, I can always do more ghost stories. Uh, well, we haven't done a magic trick yet. I've done several. I put a sword through oh, Beth's throat. Right. I did the zombie ball. Oh, you did the zombie ball. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, if we if we want, I could read because uh, we're coming down to the last twenty five minutes or so. Yeah, I could read the. Uh, yeah, why don't you my, read the? And I, he's going to run an excerpt from Ancient Enemies. Ancient Enemies. Yeah, this is the new. Uh, this is the new novel. Uh, it's gotten. People seem to really like the the opening scene, so I'm going to do the opening scene. 
uh, and read read that here on air, uh, just for fun, give you an idea. Uh, this is the second book in the uh, Hegemony trilogy. Uh, third one's not out yet. Or you don't worry, you don't need to have read the first book to get this, the the scene I have read. No, scene. that's why I'm picking this. Yeah. Is it's pretty uh, self-explanatory and, and fun. Uh, but yeah, they're all available on Amazon.com. Uh, Brian McKinley is uh, my author name, also my regular name. So, <clears throat> chapter one. A vampire walked into an Overeaters Anonymous meeting. <laughs> it sounds like the opening of a joke, but I'm the vampire, and this was my life. I'm still constantly hungry, I told them when it was my turn to share. We met as usual in a basement meeting room of a Long Island church. Luckily for me, the old trope about vampires fearing religious symbols and being unable to enter churches and such is bullshit. I suppose I should say that it's BS for vampires, which is the type of vampire I am. I haven't had any lapses since the ice cream incident a few we months ago, but I'm still tempted to binge almost all the time. I sipped my water and several of the ladies smiled in sympathy. You'd picture an OA meeting being full of overweight people, but that's not always the case. Many of the women, most are women, there are only a couple of guys who have the guts to come to such meetings, are average and some are athletic and wiry. Only a few are significantly overweight. I used to be heavy, but part of the transformation process of becoming a vampire involves the body fat uh, burning off in excess, so now I have the gaunt look that's common among us. I set my water down. Things with me and my girlfriend haven't changed much lately. I still don't see a lot of her because of her job and the research that she's always working on whenever she's not busy with the job. I really thought that being her assistant would bring, me a, bring us closer again, but so far it hasn't happened. I mean, I know it would, be, it would bother most guys to work for their girlfriend, but that's not really an issue with me. Carolyn's great at what she does. She's way smarter than me and she's earned that position. The problem is that as soon as it happened, our relationship suffered. First, she left for almost a year doing training with the big boss, and I was cool with it. But when she got back, she was still always preoccupied. I did a bunch of things for her while she was gone, and apparently they were all wrong, so she redid them. I paused, remembering how horrible I'd felt at letting her down, but also how angry I'd been that she hadn't seemed to appreciate how much work I'd put in. I guess if there is an issue with the job, it's like, is she seeing me as just another employee now, rather than a partner and a lover? Can a relationship work when part of it involves the inequality of boss and employer? No one in the horseshoe arrangement of folding chairs answered. Since our group's structure is to let one person share completely before moving on to another. I glanced around at the walls which featured watercolor renderings of Bible verses and scenes, trying to decide where to go. It was hard to convey the situation accurately without spilling the secret of the Order's existence. The fact that Carolyn's job was to oversee every vampire in North America, and that many of some said vampires wanted to kill her, wasn't something I could talk about. They probably thought Carolyn managed an insurance office or a pharmaceutical lab or something, and that I was over-dramatizing the situation. I started coming to Overeaters Anonymous two years ago after an incident where I'd attacked an old girlfriend of mine in a vamp club. I'd been a stressed depression eater back when I was a regular human, and that mentality had followed me into my transition into the order. Unfortunately, now all I could eat was blood in some form or another. The ice cream thing was true, though. You can substitute blood for milk and make something that's similar to Italian ice. I'd spent a night after a particularly bad governor's meeting binging on a tub of Chef Mike's blood and rum ice cream. Honestly, while I still had the rare white knuckle nights, I'd gotten to a pretty good place with my sobriety. The main reason I kept coming back is that OA's night is really the, the one of the times that I get to leave our private island. The group is the one place that I can really open up about some of my issues. Everyone else I know works for Carolyn, which makes talking about some of this stuff awkward. My other big worry is that I'm letting Carolyn down or embarrassing her. I, I squirmed and avoided looking at anyone. 
Her position is really complicated, and there are sorts of you know, protocols and rules that aren't written down anywhere, of course, because that would be too easy. And being her assistant, I'm supposed to know them all. There have been a few times recently where I screwed something up. Not like little things like putting a call through that she didn't actually want to take. No, I've done that too. But it pisses me off because I know that some of the go, go I mean, the uh, division managers that she deals with, uh, they're deliberately setting some of these up. Because if I screw up, they can blame her and use that to try to go after her job. I chanced to glance around and saw that the group was still nodding and giving me encouraging looks. I took a breath. That's what bothers me, that they can use my failures to hurt her. I can't stand that idea, and it stresses me out. I'm trying. I want to be able to help her. I've been practicing the steps as best as I can, trying to take it one day at a time, and looking for guidance from my higher power. But it's also really great to have all of you here to listen to me. That's all I have. I don't think we have time to keep, because it's 8.15. Okay. I do apologize, Brian. I I happen to enjoy your writing. It just it's like we got about fifteen minutes, and that's nah, all right. It's only I know it's only so uh, exciting listening to someone read from a book. Anyway, so uh, I actually rather enjoy enjoy hearing your words and your voice, as it were. It's it's cool. I mean, I, I don't mind doing readings and stuff. It's just for yeah, you know, it's live more. Radio. We probably should have done it a little earlier, and you would have had the time had more time. Because yeah. I'm looking at the time, and it's like I was I was actually getting close to where I was going to stop. Anyway. Oh, okay. I, I would have stopped. Maybe. I thought you were going to go through the whole chapter. I'm like, oh, hey, God, no. I wouldn't do that. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I was going to stop maybe about two or three paragraphs when uh, he left the meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just going to get to the funny part and then just sort of. So, it, uh, ladies and gents, um, we are coming up on the end. We'll be ending at eight thirty. Um, I did want to do a quick couple more things. One, I want to again give up the phone number in case anybody's got any final questions. 609-807-2492, 609-807-2492. Feel free to call in. Um, we're always happy to do that. We do have... Please support our starving vampires. I, I was going to I was going to put some things up. I found some pictures. We'll do a video on YouTube of it. How's yeah. that? In the arms of the angels. If you don't donate money, he's going to keep singing. I'm going to keep singing until uh, money starts rolling in. Beth, what's the name of next week's guest again? Next week's guest is going to be... Something Newman. I don't remember his first name. I know. I'm getting, I'm getting it. I know. I, I'm more making... Uh, uh, dissing myself for forgetting. Can, can we say, hello, Newman? <laughs> All right. So, ne yes. Next week we have Rick Newman... And go. his recent um, literary work on ghosts related to the Civil War. Oh, it's yeah. the Civil War ghost thing, yes. And there's a lot of ghosts related to the Civil War. Um, I would imagine. There was both, a lot of I've heard stories died. out of both Gettysburg and Antietam. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of people died there. I mean, just, just by the odds, there'd have to be a few ghosts. <laughs> and after that, we're having a friend of mine, actually. Oh. So the following week, we're going to have Lilith Moore. She's a professional storyteller. Um, you've heard me speak before, and I was just this last two weeks at Def Mock events. Um, she's a frequent performer there and a very good friend. Her her um, husband, Micah, is going to be joining us as well. Micah wrote a very entertaining book called OK, So Look, which is a, a very honest abridgment of the book of Genesis from a very humorous perspective. Oh, interesting. But I, I, the humor is pretty much very straightly playing. I'm, th I'm thinking if they're open to it, we may just do the full hour. We'll do Will at the first hour and Mike at the second. Because otherwise I'm not seeing how we're going to divide the time evenly between the two of them. Do that. Um, but they're a lot of fun. And then the last one, the next one after that is, and I forget his name as well, is a gentleman who just wrote, who created and then just wrote a book about the spirit box, which is a very interesting piece of paranormal equipment. Oh, I've yeah, been needing to buy one myself. That. Um, at some point in the near future as well, probably after the show next week, we got some EVPs while we were away. Yes, um, I was just going to say we forgot to uh, mention our four. Uh, I, I actually was somewhat deliberately avoiding doing them because I haven't gotten all the emails yet. Oh, okay. So we did, did when we were I up may have, I may have heard my first ghost. I think Brian did hear his first ghost. Chris Moon is who you were thinking of. Oh, uh, yes. Chris Moon is the author of uh, Ghost Box, who's our guest after Lilith. 
Um, but yeah, we did electronic voice phenomenon. For those of you who don't know, and we'll actually do it on the show. Probably next week after the Civil War Ghosts, we'll bring in the recorder and do some as well as play the ones we got. It is an honor recording where you t- attempt to record the voice of ghosts. We got a couple while we were up in the Catskills. We're gonna um, actually. I think we got a couple of friends of mine. <laughs> well, we had we had the one that I was really excited about, but then you thought that. that then we realized that it was me. It was you talking. It was like oh. It was a friend of, well, thought, thought we heard a ghost saying hello, clear as day, and we were all like really freaked out and amazed. And then we remembered, no wait. And then, then we remembered Kevin saying, you know, hello. <laughs> Kevin made a big boner and said yeah. something out of turn, which I should have done better than to do. But and then you forgot about it. Specifically, my friend Holly, who was there, had felt someone touch her on the back. And so in response to them, like, oh, hello, as in we got something. Yeah. Um, and for that matter, the first weekend when Brian wasn't there, we got some interesting results as well. The first weekend, I give off all the negative energy, you know. Sadly, because we were doing audio recording, not video recording, we can't show this, but we have my friend Aaliyah who's there, and her cell phone lights up on its own. You know, lots of people's cell phones, mine included, will light up if they get a text message or something like that. Nope, no text message, nothing like that. The button wasn't in a position, nor was anyone close enough for anybody to put it touch it. It lit up almost immediately in response to a question. And then the next two questions we asked, other people said, other one, no, her cell phone lit, lit up again two more times. All in response to questions, not in, you know, no other times in, during the night. And we may even get some EVPs in here, I think. Well, based on the, uh, some of the Equipment failures we keep having. Maybe. So, for those of you who are curious, um, we've been informed by our um, studio end that we've been having the show cut in and out all night and having a bunch of weird effects, like internet effects. You called them pups. Um, this, for those of you who have been around since the Lou Gentilly days, will know. And um, for those of you who don't, will learn is par for the course with Paranormal Radio. Weird stuff is going to happen. Um, I've already seen figures moving around in here once or twice when we were doing the show. Um, I'm waiting to go full board and have the lights go out on us again like it happened during the Amityville Horror... Or was it Amityville? Yeah, Amityville Horror Week. Don't, don't, don't ask for stuff. That is definitely a subject we need to talk about at some length at some point, which is Amityville. Oh, yeah. Um, You've got so many stories about that. Maybe, yeah. maybe on an anniversary or something. Uh, yeah. Or you get oh, it's coming up because the, the whole thing happened in December, actually. Oh, maybe you can get somebody who wrote a book or something on it. Or... I'm wondering if I could re- reach out and get either Chris or Dan- Daniel Lutz. Hmm. Which are, so, five people in the family. There was George, Kathy, Chris, Danny, and... Um, Oh, what's her name? Okay, the daughter whose name I'm completely blanking on. George and Kathy have since passed away, but the, the kid, um, the two boys certainly are still alive. I think the daughter may be still alive as well. I don't know. I've spoken with Chris. I have never, I have not spoken with Danny, although he had, uh, Daniel Watts, for anyone who's interested, does have a documentary called Miami Eagle Horror. It was at one time on, on Netflix, I don't know if it's still there, about his experiences living in the house. Um, for the record, the people that lived in the house and actually experienced it always, you know, there, there's a very popular myth that they came out and admitted it was made up. Never happened. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to contradict me on that, I invite you to get to send me a link on YouTube to one of them actually saying it. Because I've had many people say, oh, there's a video on YouTube where so-and-so says it. It's like, okay, send me the link. Yeah. And they can never find it. Meanwhile, it's like, oh, fun fact, if you want to do a little early research, because I think, yeah, we'll probably touch on this in December, um, because it was a December case. If you go to YouTube and look up Lou Lou Gentilly Amityville Horror Week, you can hear the interviews we did about the case. Um, Still on YouTube, so they're free. Uh, Let's see. Um, Yeah, I should be able to put a link in the description. Um, the reality again is, oh, there's to close things out. I will have to tell the scariest of all ghost stories. Um, but we're not quite ready for that. But I will, I will tell the most terrifying ghost story I know. Um, 
The one that sometimes may, may or may not make people run for the hills. It was always awkward because then you have to go to the back up to the hills and find them, bring them back. And we were just in the hills last week. Yeah, that was it was a long drive. <laughs> you had the short. I, Amisha and I were in that car for seven hours. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was ridiculous because it was the Catskills to Trent to Trent to um, the ones they, Sikarkas Junction to drop off Aaliyah. Then to Trenton to drop you off. Then back to Matawan to go home. Oh, I have a scary story. Okay. Uh, there once was a pizza delivery driver. It's already horrifying. It was toward the end of the shift. And he gets, uh, gets a call on the board for the last delivery of the night. And it's out in the bad part of town. And he says, oh, I really don't want to go. But... You know, I have to. So he goes. The job. <laughs> he, he gets the gets the pizza, puts it in the thing, gets in the car, drives all the way out to the to the bad part of town, searches around for the address, which, of course, in that part of town, nobody bothers keeping their, uh, you know, their uh, house numbers updated and and whatnot. So you know, looking around. All the houses are dark because, sure, if you're expecting a pizza, why would you bother turning on your lights? You know, no, don't bother. So finally, he, he tracks down the house. He goes up and he rings the bell. Someone answers. And they take the pizza and they give him exact change and no tip. Scariest of all stories. Horror, worst horror story. Worst of all. Based on a true story, my friends. <laughs> well, based on a true story. I do actually, for that matter, want to plug, plug the Patreon link. Because, again, remember, this is to help starving vampires. Yes. You two, you know, just a dollar a day, a month even, could, could help a vampire not starve. They are so, so you're, sad. You're going to go to www.patreon.com slash D-E-M-O-N-O-L-O-G-Y. So that's patreon.com slash demonology. You should be able to see that right on your screen. Um, you can donate a dollar. You can, if you want to do advertising, you can donate more. If you want to donate more and do not do advertising, you can do that too. Um, we're still running this out of pocket with some help from friends and family. So we could definitely use any support you can give. And keep in mind, if we get a decent number of listeners, and we have been a, a dollar from everybody for 10,000 people is still $10,000. Yeah. And if you're if you have some kind of a business that uh, you could use some exposure for, especially an internet internet or an Etsy business, this is great for that. We reach people all over the place. And last time we had people. numbers, and this was three weeks ago, I want to say, yeah. we were at we were nearly thirty thousand listeners. Yeah. So that's pretty significant for a, a small. Uh, for a pretty small and again, event. this is our seventh episode. Yeah, yeah. I mean, an Amazon ad costs like more than almost twice what what we're asking. What we're asking here, and you don't get nearly the results. Um, and again, we're one way or another. It's not like we're not at a point. I'm not going to say. I should probably say because it creates that sense of urgency. But I will say honestly, we're not at a point where it's like if we don't get money, the show is going to go up. Um, we have the money to keep this going for a while, uh, you know, personal funds for quite a while, but we could use the help. I don't make that much money. Um, so we could use the assistance to just, cause ideally long-term, I, this is what I want to do. I, I want to do this. I'm thinking about getting some YouTube going again. Um, I have one episode up on the side channel called grumpy old gamer. Which is me grumble being the old man grumbling about role playing games. I'm probably going to start doing some videos about history, um, and just some other things. Because I, you know, as much as I can sometimes sound like one note pony, I do have a few things other than the paranormal I'm interested in. And the reality is, there, there's a lot of weird history people don't know about. Um, at some point, and we've ta we've talked about this before, but at some point we're definitely going to talk about conspiracy theories. And well, I, I personally have a deep abiding hatred of most conspiracy theories. Um, there are a couple of really weird conspiracy type things that have actually happened. Um, what about the conspiracy theory of vampires running the world? Oh, that's totally true. We know okay. this. Good. 
Um, which is, of course, from Brian, again, from Brian's excellent books, Ancient Blood, Ancient Enemies, and Drawing Dead. Yes. Um, for that matter, there is, in fact, a gentleman who was deeply involved in the Amityville case that claimed in his books that the U.S. government had been infiltrated by vampires. Wow. I need to look that up because I can cite that as a source. Yes, it was a gentleman by the name of Stark. Of, he called himself Doctor, though he, he did not, in fact, have a recognized doctorate, Stephen Kaplan. Ah. Um, Stephen Kaplan, the father of vampirology, according to Stephen Kaplan. Oh. Um, which is ridiculous because, you know, it's been around longer than that. He also claimed to be an expert on werewolves, an expert on ghosts. And just about every other... An expert on everything. Yeah. He was an expert on whatever was the fad at the time, basically. Nice. Um, but yeah, I've heard of this guy. He's most famous for the fact that he he's the one who came out and originally said that... It, well, he's the second person, I should say, to come out and say, Amityville didn't happen, it's a giant hoax. Um, the first person was a reporter for a big newspaper in New York who also happened to be the son of the chief of police in Amityville. Um, the reality of which being... And, you know, the case happened, it was on Channel 5 here in New Jersey, it was on all over the news, it was a big deal, and they had a whole pro big problem with Wookiee Loos coming to the house, mm -hmm. cause, you know, committing acts of vandalism, everybody wants a souvenir, so of course the police department puts out the story, it never happened, the whole thing's a hoax, go home! Yep, nothing to Spoiler again. alert, it didn't work. <laughs> All right, so if you're going to do your... Yeah, it's probably about time for the last, the, time. the scariest of all ghost stories before we call it a night. So, this did not happen to me. This is a story from Ed Warren, or Ed Warren specifically. Ed and and Lorraine are doing a lecture in the Midwest, farming area, and they notice this audience, you know, he read this inside the audience, Ed notices this little old guy. He looks a little odd, looks like a farmer, doesn't look like the sort would normally come to one of these lectures, sitting in the back. So it's near the end of the lecture. So Ed goes, okay, I'm going to poll the audience. Let's see what everybody thinks. Who here believes in ghosts? Unsurprisingly, every hand, almost every hand goes up, including this old guy in the back, who, again, Ed noticed very attentive, you know, asked a couple of questions. But it's like, okay, let, let, let's see, let's see. Okay, who here has actually seen a ghost? Maybe 20 hands go up? Old guy in the back? <laughs> Who? Okay, okay. Um, actually. Yeah? Um, I have actually seen a ghost. Um, this was back when I was like five. Mm -hmm. um, my father on my dad's side had actually just passed away. And um, he was a very hefty dude, smoked like a chimney, drank mm -hmm. like a fish. Um, and he used to be built, as my father would put it. He, he was a uh, brick outhouse, essentially. <laughs> um, but... Um, when he took a desk job, everything just kind of went mm -hmm. the wayside, heart disease, whole nine yards, and he eventually had complications, and he actually had passed away on his way to the hospital. Ooh. Now, shortly afterwards, and this was after we had buried him, mm -hmm. um, my grandfather was notorious for sitting on the main couch in the living room. I was staying at my dad's. My parents were divorced, and it was his weekend, so I mm -hmm. went downstairs um, at my grandmother's from the second floor down to the first floor. And he had this long black coat that was always on um, the rack that was along the closet door. And when I, uh, or next to the closet door, it was like a proper coat rack. Yeah. And when I came down, I saw my grandfather a little leaner, but it was him. Mm -hmm. And he, it, it you know that scene in um, Christmas Carol where um, Ghosts of Future Present or Ghosts of Christmas P Future mm -hmm. opens their cloak and there's nothing but horrors inside? Yeah. It was kind of like that. There was nothing in there when he opened the coat to give me a hug and I bolted because I wanted out because it felt like he was suffocating me. But it was just him trying to say goodbye one goodbye. last time. Mm -hmm. and, but my father couldn't get word one out of me for like years before I finally told him what actually happened. Okay, let me finish up my story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, but the next show is here, I believe, so we need to get this wrapped. Yes. Um, so Ed goes, okay, who here has ever spoken to a ghost? Two hands go up, including the guy in the back. So Ed asks one last question. He's sure that nobody, especially this weirdo, is going to answer yes to. Who here has ever had sex? 
with a ghost. Dead silence. You could hear a pen drop. <laughs> but the little man, old man's hand goes up. Yeah. Ed looks at him in utter shock. Really, sir? You've had sex with a ghost? And the old man looks at him and he blinks and he starts to laugh. He goes, oh, I'm sorry, Sonny. You said ghost? I thought you said goat. Okay, that's going to do it for tonight. I want to wait for this is Kevin Mears, demonologist. I want to wish you all a happy delay, Halloween. Huh? So I want to wish everybody a happy Halloween. And Brian, you want to sign out? Okay. Uh, yes, happy Halloween. Uh, stay, stay spooky. Uh. <laughs>